welcome back in the last few lectures we discussed uh, compression refrigeration systems so in this lecture i shall introduce another very important refrigeration system known as vapor absorption refrigeration system so the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to introduce basic concepts of vapor absorption refrigeration systems introduce simple vapor absorption refrigeration system derive expression for maximum cop discuss properties of ideal and real solutions describe a basic uh, vapor absorption refrigeration system with solution heat exchanger and finally uh, discuss desirable properties of refrigerant absorbent mixers at the end of this lesson you should be able to explain basic principles of absorption refrigeration systems estimate maximum cop of absorption refrigeration systems differentiate between ideal and real solutions describe the basic absorption refrigeration system with solution heat exchanger and finally list desirable properties of refrigerant absorbent paints let me give, give a brief introduction uh, vapor absorption refrigeration systems belong to the class of vapor cycle similar to vapor compression refrigeration systems okay that means they are uh, just like vapor compression system these are also vapor cycles that means as i have already explained the working fluid undergoes a phase change during the cycle so they are uh, vapor cycles like compression systems but there is one major difference between absorption systems and compression systems what is the difference unlike uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems the required input to absorption systems is mainly in the form of low grade thermal energy if you remember in the compression systems the major input uh, uh, or the input to the system is in the form of mechanical energy to run the compressor okay so that is uh, you can call that as a work operated system whereas in absorption refrigeration systems the main input to the system is in the form of low grade thermal energy or heat that's why these systems are also known as heat operated systems or the thermal energy driven systems okay this is the major difference between compression systems and absorption systems these uh, absorption systems are also widely used in various refrigeration and air conditioning applications since absorption refrigeration systems run on low grade thermal energy they are preferred when low grade energy such as waste heat or solar energy is available there are many industries and many situations where uh, plenty of uh, low grade uh, thermal energy is either uh, rejected it's not used properly okay in such circumstances uh, one can use vapor absorption refrigeration systems by tapping the low grade thermal energy the typical example is the waste heat rejected in many of the process plants etc or you can also use other low grade energy sources such as solar energy to drive the vapor absorption system this is one of the main uh, applications and advantages of uh, absorption systems compared to compression system that means you can use low grade uh, energy sources okay and since uh, the working fluids used in absorption systems are uh, mainly natural working fluids that means you use either water or ammonia which are uh, natural refrigerants these systems are uh, environment friendly okay these are uh, two uh, most important advantages of absorption systems compared to vapor compression refrigeration systems so as i said since conventional absorption systems use natural refrigerants such as water or ammonia they are environment friendly now let us look at some basic concepts the first uh, basic concept is that when a solute for example such as a lithium bromide salt is dissolved in a solvent uh, for example water the boiling point of the solution is elevated okay this uh, this you can also state in another uh, way uh, for example if you are keeping the temperature constant and if you are dissolving the solute in a solvent then the effect of this uh, dissolving is to reduce the vapor pressure of the solvent below that of its saturation pressure at that temperature So this is the basic concept based on which the absorption systems have been built okay so now let us look at uh, the most uh, basic uh, absorption system um, in a basic absorption system refrigeration is obtained by connecting two vessels with one vessel containing pure solvent so we call it as refrigerant and the other containing a solution which is a mixture of refrigerant plus absorbent at equilibrium the temperature of the solution will be higher than that of the pure refrigerant when the pressures are same obviously as i have mentioned already the temperature of the solution will be higher than that of the uh, so, so pure solvent and if the solution is at ambient temperature obviously the solvent that means the refrigerant will be at a temperature lower than the ambient that means there is a temperature difference between the ambient and the solvent 
So, this is the temperature difference using which you can produce a refrigeration effect. So, this is the basic principle. Now, let me explain this uh, with this schematic. What I, uh, what I have shown here, uh, let us look at the initial conditions. Initially, we have two vessels A and uh, vessel B. Uh, vessel A consists of pure water at 30 degree centigrade and vessel B consists of a solution of water and lithium bromide, 50 percent lithium bromide by mass. Okay. So, one is a pure solvent that is water, the other one is a mixture of water and lithium bromide salt. Uh, let us say that initially the valve is closed and the entire system is in thermal equilibrium with the surroundings which is at 30 degree centigrade. So, everywhere you have 30 degree centigrade in vessel B as well as vessel A and vessel A and B are isolated. Okay. So, now what is the vapor pressure in vessel A and what is the vapor pressure in vessel B? If you look at the steam tables or uh, steam charts, you will find that at 30 degree centigrade, the saturation uh, pressure of water is 4.24 kilo Pascal. That means, the pressure inside the vessel A, that means this side of the system is 4.24 kilo Pascal, which is nothing but the saturation uh, pressure of water at 30 degree centigrade. Now, what is the pressure on uh, in vessel B? Since in vessel B, we have we do not have pure water, but we have a solution. Obviously, at the same temperature, there will be a lower vapor pressure. And if you look at the properties of lithium bromide water solution, you will find that at 50 percent concentration and at 30 degree centigrade, the pressure here is 1.22 kilo Pascal. These are the pressures at equilibrium conditions. Now, you can maintain the pressures at different values because the valve is closed. Now, let us say that we have opened the valve. Okay, we'll come to this second part, we open the valve. Initially what happens because of the pressure difference, the vapor flows from this side to this side and since this solution, lithium bromide water solution has an affinity for water vapor, uh, the water vapor gets absorbed here. Okay, that means water vapor is absorbed here and the pressure try to be, tries to be same in both the vessels. Okay, so, everywhere you have the uh, uniform pressure. Now, suppose uh, by some means we are able to maintain the concentration and temperature in vessel B. Okay, uh, let us uh, discuss how we can do this at a little later, but uh, for, for the time being assume that we are able to maintain the composition and temperature. Then what will be the pressure in the entire system? The pressure in the entire system will be 1.22 kilo Pascal, which is decided by the solution and this is nothing but the equilibrium uh, vapor pressure at this composition and this temperature. So, on this side also you have 1.22 kilo Pascal. Okay. If you have 1.22 kilo Pascal here, what will be the water temperature? So, again if you look at the steam tables or charts, you will find that at 1.22 kilo Pascal, this temperature at equilibrium is nothing but the saturation temperature corresponding to this pressure. That means, you will have 10 degree centigrade temperature in the vessel A. Okay, that means, by having this combination and by opening the valve, I could reduce the temperature from 30 degrees to 10 degrees centigrade. Okay. And as long as you can maintain the conditions in B, the conditions in A can be maintained at 1.22 kilo Pascal and 10 degree centigrade. Now, the outside temperature is 30 degree centigrade and the water is uh, at 10 degree centigrade and let us assume that we do not have, uh, we have diathermic valves, that means heat can be transferred from outside to the water. So, there is heat transfer from the surroundings to the water and as a result of the heat transfer, the water will evaporate. Okay. And this vapor continuously flows from uh, vessel A to vessel B where it gets absorbed. Now, the absorption process is an exothermic process in this case. So, heat is released and since we want to maintain the temperature at 30 degree centigrade, this heat has got to be continuously rejected to the surroundings. That means, during this step, what we are doing is we are adding heat at vessel A and we are rejecting heat at vessel B and you are able to produce refrigeration effect here because you are able to transfer heat from the surroundings to a body at 10 degree centigrade. Okay, that is how you are getting a refrigeration effect here. Now, if you have a finite sized vessels, let us say that means A and B are finite sized, then you have a finite amount of water in vessel A and finite amount of solution in vessel B. And as a result of this water vapor transfer from vessel A to B, at, at a point, a point may come where vessel A may become empty or uh, this may become saturated. Okay. That means, uh, once it this becomes, uh, take the first uh, case, uh, the, when this beca vessel be becomes empty, empty means empty of liquid, then there will not be any more uh, heat transfer because nothing can evaporate. Okay. So, the refrigeration effect stops here. 
Okay. That means by this means whatever refrigeration effect you are able to pr produce that is intermittent and it will stop after some point when you are using finite vessels. Okay. So, this is the so, what, do, what we have to do to continue this process? To continue this process, what we have to do is we have to bring back this system to its original position. Okay. So, how do we do that? We do that by regenerating the water vapor. Okay. So, let us uh, see what is the regeneration process. Okay. So, this is uh, this picture here shows the process of regeneration. During the regeneration process, what we do is initially we keep the valve closed and bring the vessels A and B vessel A and B again to equilibrium with the surroundings. So, again everything will be at 30 degree centigrade. Now, open the vessel, uh, open the valve and supply heat to vessel B. Okay. Now, this uh, due to the uh, vapor transfer in the previous step, uh, this solution is weak. That means, it has more water vapor. Okay. So, when you are supplying heat at a particular temperature T g, okay, when you are supplying uh, heat, then water is generated at this point. And this water vapor uh, flows from this side to this side and if you are able to keep this at 30 degree centigrade, then the water water vapor is coming here, it will condense uh, at this pressure and at this temperature. Since this is a an exothermic process, heat of condensation is rejected to the surroundings. Okay. That means, during the regeneration process what we are doing? We are supplying heat at a high temperature T g to the solution, so that vapor is generated and this vapor comes to the solvent side and it condenses by rejecting heat of condensation. Okay. So, um, you are transferring the, you are reversing the process and you are transferring water from the solution to the uh, pure solvent side. Okay. This process will continue till you get the required amount of water on this side. Okay. Then to complete the process again you have to close the valve and bring these both the vessels to equilibrium with the surroundings at 30 degree centigrade. So, the process continues. Okay. So, one thing you can notice here is we have the three temperatures here. One is the T g which is nothing but the temperature at which heat is supplied to the solution for regeneration. Okay. Let us call that as generator temperature T g. Okay. And we have another temperature called the heat sink temperature. That means, the temperature at which heat is rejected during absorption process and during the condensation process okay, T naught. And finally, we have uh, the refrigeration temperature T e. Okay. This is the temperature at which refrigeration is produced. Obviously, T g is greater than T naught is greater than Okay, this uh, uh, relation holds good. And now, how do we decide the uh, what should be this temperature and how much heat has to be supplied and all? That depends upon the uh, the temperatures. For example, the amounts of heat transferred. These dep they depend upon the properties of solution and the refrigerant and also the operating conditions. Okay. So this is the basic uh, principle of uh, a very simple uh, vapor absorption refrigerant system. Okay. So to summarize, what we have done is we have taken two vessels. In one, one vessel we have kept pure solvent and the other vessel we have a solution. Okay. So, by manipula manipulating the pressures inside by supplying heat or by rejecting heat, we could transfer vapor from the pure uh, refrigerant side to the solution side during the refrigeration process and from the solution side to the refriger refrigerant side during the regeneration process. Okay. And uh, during this uh, uh, entire process, we could get uh, refrigeration effect during one step and we have to supply uh, heat at high temperature during the regeneration process and heat is rejected um, in both the processes of refrigeration and regeneration. Okay. So, this is an intermittent system that means you are not able to get refrigeration continuously. Okay. So, you call this as an intermittent absorption refrigeration system. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, the, you call this as an intermittent system. So, with only two vessels, the refrigeration obtained is intermittent. So, no refrigeration effect is produced during vapor regeneration. And these uh, simple systems also have uh, some applications. They can be used to provide refrigeration using renewable energy such as solar energy. For example, you would like to produce refrigeration using solar energy. Okay. So, you can have a very, very simple uh, intermittent system consisting of these simple two, uh, two vessels and we are with a valve and connections. Okay. What you have to do is during the daytime when solar energy is available, refrigerant is generated okay, and it is stored as pure refrigerant. Okay. During the daytime, the, uh, the, it is the process of regeneration and during night time what happens is surroundings become cool. Okay, then the process gets reversed because, because the solution becomes cool. So, the refrigerant in the vessel, pure uh, refrigerant vessel can boil by taking heat from the surroundings. Okay, that means, you get refrigeration effect during the night 
and you have to regenerate the refrigerant during the daytime. Such systems are very, very uh, good for uh, very remote and rural areas where uh, you do not have any electrical uh, electricity supply or you want a system which is independent of your grid power. Okay. Such systems have been built and they, are, they have been used quite successfully in many remote areas. Okay. So, they are known as intermittent absorption refrigeration systems. But in practice, uh, in most of the applications, we require a continuous refrigeration. Okay. When, when you want a refrigeration continuously, obviously you cannot use this simple system with two vessels. So, you have to do certain modifications. So, this brings us to a basic vapor absorption refrigeration system for continuous output. So, continuous refrigeration can be obtained with a modified system consisting of two pairs of vessels and additional components such as expansion valves and solution pump. So, you have to have first thing is two pairs of vessel that means you will have four vessels. In addition to that you also have to have some additional components such as expansion valves and a solution pump. These systems are similar to compression systems uh, that means uh, you get uh, continuous output just like a vapor compression system, but there are uh, two uh, major differences. The major difference is uh, the way uh, the vapor is compressed. In a mechanical, uh, it is mechanical compression in vapor compression refrigeration system that means you use mechanical energy, supply the mechanical energy to the compressor and compress the vapor mechanically. Okay. So, you call uh, these systems are mechanical compression systems. Okay. And uh, in case of absorption systems, you can call that as thermal compression. Okay. If you compress the vapor thermally. Now, let me explain uh, the basic system. Okay. So, here you have uh, the basic vapor absorption refrigerant system. So, you have uh, a condenser, an expansion device and an evaporator just like a vapor compression system. The only difference between uh, vapor compression system and vapor absorption system lies in the way in which you have compressed the vapor from the evaporator. That means, what happens from this point onwards. Okay. So, in vapor compression system what is done? This low pressure, low temperature vapor is compressed mechanically. Okay. Mechanically it is compressed to high pressure, so that it can reject heat in the condenser to the external heat sink and it can uh, condense and become a liquid. Okay. So, you call this system as I said as a mechanical compression system, whereas you can see that in vapor absorption system you do not have a compressor. Okay. In place of a single component compressor you have four components, one is generator, absorber, expansion device and a solution pump. Okay. So, the combination of uh, uh, these four components replace the compressor of a vapor compression system. Okay. So, now let me explain the working principle. Let us start again from uh, the point at the outlet of the evaporator. We have low temperature, low pressure vapor at this point. Okay. It goes to the absorber. In the absorber, this uh, wave, refrigerant vapor comes in contact with uh, the solution that is coming from the generator that means this solution which is weaker in refrigerant. Okay. This is weak in refrigerant. When this solution is weak in refrigerant, it has the uh, potential to absorb the uh, refrigerant vapor. Okay. So, when this uh, refrigerant vapor comes in contact with this uh, weak solution, then uh, the vapor gets absorbed. Okay. Since the absorption process is an exothermic uh, process, heat is re rejected uh, to the atmosphere at temperature T naught and this is the amount of heat rejected during this process. Okay. So, the weak solution and refrigerant vapor are combining, heat is rejected. So, as a result of this uh, mixing, what you have uh, is a rich solution. Okay. This solution is a rich solution. Rich solution means rich in refrigerant. Now, this rich solution is pumped to the condenser pressure using a solution pump. Okay. A solution pump is used to compress the uh, vapor from the absorber, uh, from the, the compressor uh, liquid from the absorber to the condenser pressure. Okay. And uh, now, at this point you have high pressure liquid. Now, this high pressure liquid goes to the generator. In the generator, what is done is heat is supplied at high temperature. Okay. So, when you supply heat at high temperature to the rich solution, refrigerant vapor is generated. Okay. So, this refrigerant vapor at high pressure and high temperature goes to the condenser where it rejects heat to the surroundings, condenses and becomes a liquid. Okay. And this liquid uh, again expands in the expansion device. So, you have here a low quality liquid vapor 
uh, mixer at low, uh, low temperature and low pressure. This enters into the evaporator, it takes heat from the surroundings, produces the refrigeration effect and becomes the vapor again. So that is how the vapor cycle is completed. Okay. So the only difference you can notice here is uh, instead of compressing it mechanically, we have compressed it um, thermally. Okay. Now what happens to the solution? Here remember that we had a rich solution that is entering into the generator. So from that you have stripped off the refrigerant. So what you have is a weak solution. Okay. Now this weak solution is still at high pressure. Okay. So to complete the cycle for the solution, you have to reduce its um, pressure. So we use a an expansion device where the uh, liquid pressure is reduced to that of the uh, absorber uh, or evaporator okay and uh, then again it comes in contact with this vapor so the uh, solution cycle is also completed so this process goes on continuously as long as you supply heat here you reject heat uh, at absorber and condenser and you have refrigeration effect continuously okay so this is the principle of uh, a very basic vapor uh, absorption refrigeration system and as I said, uh, you can feel uh, the similarities just like vapor compression system, you have two pressure levels here, PC and PE here, PC and PE here. Okay. However, unlike vapor uh, compression system, there are two, three temperatures here. In vapor compression system, we have only two temperatures that is this is the T0 is the heat sink temperature and, and TE is the low temperature heat source, heat source temperature. Okay. Whereas in absorption system, we have three temperatures. One is Te, that is the low temperature source, uh, low source. Uh, then T0 is the heat sink temperature and Tz is the high temperature uh, heat source okay, at where from which you supply the heat to the generator. So this is a three temperature cycle and vapor compression reference system is a two temperature cycle. Okay, so the major difference is uh, you have seen. Now, what is the advantage of this? I mean, you, uh, if you look at uh, the components and the schematic, you will find that the vapor absorption system is a uh, lot more complicated uh, compared to vapor compression system. We had only four components in vapor compression system, whereas we had seven components in vapor absorption systems. Okay, and uh, you might have noticed that even though we did not use a compressor we still used a pump in the vapor absorption system. Now the pump requires mechanical energy. Okay. So both vapor absorption systems as well as vapor compression systems both need the uh, mechanical energy, one to run the compressor and uh, in other case you need it for running the pump. Okay. And in addition to that you also have to supply heat at high temperature. Okay. Since uh, mechanical energy is required in both the cases, what is the advantage of absorption system compared to compression systems? The advantage is like this. In the compression system, you are compressing a vapor. Okay, so the mechanical energy required to compress a vapor is quite large. Whereas in vapor absorption system, you are pumping a liquid, and the work required to pump a liquid for the over the same pressure difference is much less compared to the work required for compressing a vapor. Okay, this is the major difference. That means the amount of mechanical energy required in vapor absorption system is very very small compared to a vapor compression refrigeration system. Okay. In fact, it is practically negligible when you compare it with the heat input. So that is why uh, absorption systems are mainly called as uh, heat operated system because that is the major heat input is, major input is in the form of heat. Okay. Uh, why do, how do we say that uh, the mecha energy required uh, for com compressing a uh, vapor is much higher than uh, the energy required for pumping a liquid because you have seen that the work input is simply equal to integral VDP. Uh, and uh, the V is nothing but the specific volume of the working fluid. In one case you have a vapor which has a very high specific volume, that is why integral VDP is very high. Whereas in absorption system you have a liquid with very small specific volume. So integral VDP is very small, so the mechanical energy requirement is very small. Okay? So this is the major difference and major advantage of absorption systems over compression systems. Okay? So that is what I have uh, mentioned here, work input required to pump uh, liquid solution is much less than the work required for compressing vapor. So the mechanical energy required to operate absorption systems is much less than that required to operate a compression system. However, uh, of course you have to pay somewhere, so uh, what do you do in uh, instead of a uh, mechanical energy you have to supply a large amount of low grade thermal energy to operate the absorption system. And as I said, the solution pump work is often negligible compared to the generator heat input. 
So if you are uh, defining COPF just like the compression system, you can see that the COPF compression system is defined as the refrigeration uh, capacity divided by the power input to the compressor WC, whereas the COPF vapor absorption system you have two, two inputs and one output, output is QE, input is the heat input uh, QZ plus uh, work input WP. And as I have said, WP is negligible compared to QZ. So, COP of absorption refrigeration system is almost equal to QE by QZ only. That means, uh, refrigeration capacity divided by the heat input to the generator. Okay. So, this is the major difference between again compression and absorption systems in terms of COPs. Since uh, vapor absorption refrigeration system uses uh, low grade energy as input, the COP of uh, absorption system is generally much smaller than COP of compression refrigeration system. Obviously, uh, if you are uh, uh, I mean if you are comparing the COPs, uh, you get the much higher COPs in case of uh, compression systems okay, because the quality of the energy that you are supplying to the system is much higher. Okay, work is a high, high grade energy compared to heat. Okay, so, the COPs are uh, larger. Okay. But of course, uh, comparing the systems based on uh, COPs, you can call also call the COP as the first law efficiency. Uh, comparing the efficiencies based on COPs is not really justified always because the quality is different and the cost is also different. Okay. That means, uh, comparing systems based on COPs is not fully justified as mechanical energy is more expensive than thermal energy. Hence, sometimes uh, what we do is we define what is known as a second law or exergetic efficiency to compare different refrigeration systems. And you will find that but the second law efficiency of absorption system is of the same order as that of a compression system. Okay, that means, if you are comparing the uh, two systems based on COPs, uh, then absorption system is definitely um, uh, bad because you get very low COP. But as I said, uh, since the uh, numerator and denominator are of different qualities, uh, if you want to get the real picture, you must convert them into the same quantity. Okay, that means, you have to convert uh, uh, the numerator and denominator in uh, expression for COP into XRG let us say, then you get what is known as second law efficiency or exergetic efficiency. When you are doing this, you will find that the COP of absorption, uh, I am sorry, the exergetic efficiency of absorption system is almost same as that of a compression system. Okay. So, it does not look so bad when you are uh, looking at the exergetic um, efficiency. Okay. Uh, this uh, you can also justify this in an another way. For example, when you are uh, talking about the COP of a compression system, uh, what is the input? Input is the work uh, mechanical energy. Okay. Most of the times, the mechanical energy is uh, derived from the electrical energy. That means, you to run a compressor, you, sub you supply the electrical energy. Okay. And how do you get the electrical energy? Electrical energy is generated, let us say, in a thermal power plant. Okay. And typical efficiency of a thermal power plant could be about 40 percent. You are not really taking that efficiency into account when you are calculating the COP of the vapor compression system. Okay. So, take that efficiency also into account, you will find that uh, the compression systems are not um, so efficient compared to uh, vapor absorption systems or in other words, both are equally good or bad. Okay. Now, uh, when we discuss vapor compression refrigeration systems, uh, how if you remember how did we begin? We began with a, an ideal cycle. Okay. First, we have defined an ideal cycle and we found what is the maximum possible COP uh, of this uh, cycle. That means, uh, we, uh, we found uh, the maximum possible COP of a compression system. Okay. And if you remember, uh, it, it was the Kano COP. Okay. That means, uh, the reverse Kano cycle gives the maximum uh, COP. So, first we obtained the expression for uh, the COP of a reverse Kano cycle and then we obtained the expression for the uh, COPs for the real cycles. Okay. Uh, and if you remember, I said that the objective of this is to compare how good is the actual cycle with the best possible or with the ideal cycle. Okay. So, in case of absorption systems also, let us first look at uh, what is the maximum possible COP. Okay. Uh, then we will move on to the actual systems. So, as I said for compression refrigeration system, the maximum COP is given by Kano COP and Kano COP if you remember is simply given by T e divided by T c minus T e, where T e and T c are evaporator and condenser temperatures. However, in uh, simple absorption refrigeration system, we have three temperatures. So, when you have three temperature levels, how do you get the uh, maximum COP? Okay. Uh, one thing is uh, for sure that uh, the COP will be maximum when the system is totally reversible. That means, when you have an ideal vapor absorption refrigeration system, where uh, it is uh, reversible internally as well as externally. Okay, that means, a totally reversible system. 
So, the COP of ideal vapor absorption deficiency system can be obtained by applying first and second laws of thermodynamics. Okay. So, what we do is we take a ideal system and then you apply the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Let me show how we can do this. Okay, what I have shown here is the basic vapor absorption deficiency system. This is the absorption deficiency system which is operating in a cyclic manner. Okay, you can see the cycle. And here we have uh, three temperatures as I said, generator temperature, evaporator temperature and the heat sink temperature. And uh, this figure also shows various energy uh, flows. Okay. For example, uh, you take uh, high temperature heat input QZ to the system uh, near the generator and uh, this system takes uh, low temperature heat input QE at refrigeration temperature T E and it rejects heat to the heat sink and heat rejection takes place at the absorber Q A plus condenser Q C. Okay. So, heat rejected is Q A plus Q C whereas, heat input is Q Z and Q E. Q Z is at the generator and Q E is at the evaporator. In addition to that, we also supply uh, mechanical energy to run the pump okay, W P. So, these are the total uh, energy flows in a simple vapor absorption deficiency system. So, if you apply a first law of thermodynamics, what is the first law of thermodynamics? If you remember, simply we have Okay. And for the cycle, uh, the net energy change is 0 because the working fluid is undergoing a cyclic process. Okay. So, what is the energy change, uh, uh, cyclic energy change? You can simply write this uh, as Q e plus Q z minus Q c plus a. Q c plus a is nothing but Q c plus Q a okay. plus W p is 0. This is nothing but this expression where uh, as I said uh, Q e and Q z are positive because you are supplying them to the system. This is negative because this is the heat rejected from the system and uh, mega work input required for the pump is also positive because that is also supplied. Okay. So, whatever is supplied to the system is positive and whatever is rejected from the system is negative. Okay. So, this is how you get the first law of thermodynamics, very simple energy balance. Now, what is the second law of thermodynamics? We write the second law of thermodynamics in uh, the form of entropy change. And if you remember the second law of thermodynamics says that the total entropy change, that means the entropy change of the system plus surroundings will always be greater than or equal to 0 and this equal sign is for completely reversible uh, if everything is uh, reversible and the greater than is for irreversible uh, systems. Okay. So, this is the second law of thermodynamics. right? Now, let us write uh, expressions for uh, delta surroundings in terms of Q e, Q z and Q c. Now, what is the entropy change of the system? Obviously, entropy change of the system is 0. right? So, delta S system is 0 because the working fluid is undergoing a cyclic process. Okay. So, delta S uh, system is 0. right? That means, uh, ultimately the second law of thermodynamics uh, when you apply to this uh, simply becomes delta S total uh, is equal to delta S surrounding which is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, uh, delta F system is 0 because the system undergoes a cyclic process. Okay. Now, we write uh, the expression for delta S uh, surroundings. Surroundings means we have three temperature uh, reservoirs. One is the low temperature reservoir at T e, the other one is at high temperature reservoir at T z and this is the medium temperature heat sink at T naught. Okay. And what is the entropy change of uh, these reservoirs? The entropy change of uh, low temperature reservoir is this minus Q e by T e minus because the reservoir is losing heat okay, and the its temperature is constant. Okay. So, delta S if you remember is uh, dou Q by T because you are uh, uh, the reservoir is undergoing a reversible temperature change. So, you can write this and uh, T is constant. So, simply this becomes uh, 1 Q 2 or whatever it is delta Q divided by the particular temperature. So, when you are applying this to the evaporator this becomes minus Q e by T e when you apply this to the generator, this becomes minus QG by TZ and when you are applying this to the heat sink, this becomes plus because heat sink is taking the energy and uh, this energy is taken at temperature T naught. So, okay, so, this is the expression for the entropy change of the surroundings. Okay. Now, you combine the first and second laws, so you get this expression. Okay. Uh, this expression relates the QZ and QE. What we are doing is we are eliminating Q A plus C by using the first law. Okay, so you that is eliminated and then you end up get this expression. Now, if you are neglecting pump work, okay, that means you are neglecting pump work, and if you de define C O P as we have seen, 
COP is equal to QE divided by QZ. Okay. You will find that from this expression, COP of a vapor absorption refrigeration system is given by this expression. Okay. That means always less than or equal to TE divided by T0 minus TE into Tg minus T0 by Tg, where remember that Tg is the generator temperature, which is the highest uh, temperature in the cycle. Uh, T0 is the heat sink temperature and T is the lowest temperature of the evaporator. Okay. Now, for a totally, because uh, we started this uh, discussion of, uh, with a view to find out the maximum COP. Okay. So, as I said, maximum COP uh, takes place when the system is ideal. Okay. And for an ideal system, entropy change is 0. Okay. Entropy change of system is 0 for both ideal as well as real system because it is a cyclic process. So, for an ideal system in addition to this, this also should be 0. Okay. That means delta S surroundings for a completely reversible system is equal to 0. So, if you are equating uh, this from the earlier expression, you will get this expression. Okay. From this expression, you get the uh, COP for an ideal system. This is the maximum possible COP of Okay, of any vapor absorption refrigeration system operating between three temperatures T e, T naught and T g. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, this expression, you will uh, notice an interesting thing. For example, you take a look at this quantity okay, and uh, look at this quantity. This quantity, for example, looks like the Kano COP of a vapor compression system okay. uh, because if you remember uh, Kano COP is simply given by T e divided by T c minus T e where Tc is equal to T0 in this case. So, this uh, particular quantity is nothing but the COP of a Kano system. And what is this quantity? This quantity is nothing but the efficiency of a Kano heat engine. Okay. So, the ultimately the COP of an ideal vapor absorption system is shown to be a product of Kano COP into Kano heat engine. Okay. That means, you can uh, show uh, an ideal vapor absorption system as a combination of Kano heat engine and Kano refrigerator. Okay. So, what you are doing is this is the generator. Okay. You supply QZ from the generator to a Kano heat engine and uh, produce work and uh, reject some heat to the surroundings and this work is used to run a Kano refrigerator. Okay, so, the same work is supplied to run a Kano refrigerator and this refrigerator takes heat from the low temperature surroundings QE and again it rejects the heat to the heat sink T0 and the efficiency of this the heat engine is nothing but Tg minus T0 T by Tg and COP of this Kano cycle is uh, if you remember T divided by T0 minus T. So, the combined efficiency of this uh, N combined is nothing but the efficiency of this multiplied by the efficiency of this that is N e into C O P R. Okay. So, that is how you can split a three temperature refrigerant system as a combination of two two temperature systems. So, you can see that uh, so from this you can um, easily uh, infer that the COP of an ideal vapor absorption system increases as evaporator temperature increases, as generator temperature increases and heat sink temperature decreases. When uh, generator temperature increases and uh, heat sink temperature decreases, the heat engine efficiency increases. Okay. And similarly, when the evaporator temperature increases and the condenser temperature uh, reduces, the COP of the Kano refrigeration cycle increases. So, as a result of which, uh, the combined efficiency improves. Okay, so, if you want to have a very high COP of a vapor absorption refrigeration system, an ideal system, you have to operate the system at as high a generator temperature as possible, as high an evaporator temperature as possible and as low a heat sink temperature as possible. Okay. However, uh, you will find that the COP of actual systems will be much smaller than the ideal COP due to various internal and external irreversibilities. So, as usual, you will find that all real systems. Uh, will give COPs which are much smaller than the ideal system COP. Okay. This is mainly because of the uh, river, uh, irreversibilities. Remember that an ideal the difference between ideal and uh, real cycle is lies in the irreversibilities. Okay. So, in the real cycle you have irreversibilities both internal as well as external. Okay. For example, what are the internal irreversibilities? Internal irre irreversibilities could be uh, pressure drop due to friction, 
it could be in this case uh, uh, irreversibility due to mixing right and uh, the external irreversibilities are uh, irreversibility due to temperature difference uh, between the working fluid and the external heat sink or source okay so major mainly the temperature differences these are the different irreversibilities which are a must in a real system okay so as a result the real system cop will be much less than the ideal vapor absorbing different system cop okay now let us look at properties of refrigerant absorbent mixers uh, the solution used in absorption different systems may be considered as a homogeneous binary mixer of refrigerant and absorbent okay well, you have noticed that uh, in the thermal compression part uh, of the vapor absorption system we have a solution okay a solution circulates through the components and this so uh, what is the solution this solution is uh, nothing but a mixer of refrigerant and absorbent and for simplicity we assume that it's a binary mixer and it's a homogeneous mixer okay now depending upon the boiling point difference between the refrigerant and absorbent and the operating temperatures one may encounter a pure refrigerant vapor or a mixture of refrigerant and absorbent vapor in generator of the absorption system okay that means while uh, uh, discussing the or describing the simple vapor absorption different system i mentioned that in the generator you supply heat at high temperature and refrigerant vapor is generated okay and that refrigerant vapor goes to the condenser it gets condensed and all that but in actual uh, systems depending upon the boiling point uh, temperature difference between the refrigerant and absorbent in addition to the refrigerant vapor you may also have some vapor of the absorbent in the generator okay that means when you are supplying heat to the generator both refrigerant as well as absorbent may boil okay that means what goes to the condenser may not be pure refrigerant but a mixture of refrigerant and absorbent vapors okay whether you have a mixer or a pure refrigerant dep purely depends upon the boiling point temperature different between uh, the refrigerant and absorbent if you have a very high boiling point temperature different that means when the absorbent is non volatile then you will find that uh, whatever is generated in the generator is uh, pure refrigerant okay on the other hand if the temperature difference is not too high that means the absorbent is also volatile then uh, both will be generated in the generator okay an example of the first case where you have a non volatile uh, absorbent is uh, when you use uh, water and lithium bromide okay so where lithium bromide is absorbent it is non volatile so pure water vapor is generated whereas if you use ammonia water systems where water is absorbent uh, and ammonia is a refrigerant both water and uh, uh, ammonia may be generated in the generator okay so this is the difference between uh, different refrigerant absorbent pairs okay now properties of binary solutions are evaluated from pressure temperature composition data so if you want to find the properties you have to specify pressure temperature and composition composition of the solution can be expressed either in mass fraction or in mole fraction okay so what is mass fraction mole fraction so mass fraction is uh, defined as uh, okay mass fraction is also sometimes called as concentration concentration of component 1 so i1 is simply defined as a mass of uh, that particular component divided by the total mass of the solution okay that means m1 divided by m1 plus m2 similarly uh, mass fraction or concentration of component 2 is nothing but mass of that component in the solution m2 divided by the total mass of the solution okay m1 and m2 are mass of component 1 and 2 so for a binary uh, system you can very easily show that z1 uh, plus z2 is equal to 1 from the above expression that means z2 is equal to 1 minus z1 okay so if you know the composition of one component the composition of the other component can be easily obtained okay now the composition in terms of mole fraction so in instead of talking about uh, masses we talk about the number of moles so mole fraction of component 1 is nothing but the ratio of number of moles of component 1 divided by the total number of moles of component 1 and 2 in the solution okay similarly mole fraction of 2 x2 is given by n2 divided by n1 plus n2 where n1 and n2 are number of moles of component 1 and 2 okay just like uh, the mass fraction uh, it can be very easily shown shown that x1 plus x2 is equal to 1 or x2 is equal to 1 minus x1 
and very uh, another very important property as far as refrigerant absorbent uh, peaks are concerned is what is known as miscibility okay and miscibility is an important property and it depends upon the operating conditions that means under certain operating conditions a refrigerant absorbent pair may not be very highly miscible whereas at other condition they may be highly miscible okay so it depends upon the operating conditions and generally refrigerant absorbent pairs must be completely miscible both in liquid as well as vapor phases so that's how you choose the pairs so that uh, they get mixed completely and you get a homogeneous mixer now let us define uh, what is known as an ideal homogeneous binary mixer okay a solution is called as an ideal solution if specific volume of the mixer is equal to the sum of the volume of its constituents that means let us take a binary mixer i take uh, uh, component 1 and component 2 component 1 has a specific volume of uh, v1 and uh, component 2 has specific volume v2 and i mix certain masses of these two components you will find that the specific volume of the mixer is simply equal to the volumes of its constituents okay, sum of the volume of its constituents okay no. then uh, during this mixing process neither heat is generated nor absorbed okay so this is another characteristic of uh, ideal solution and the mixer obeys uh, rolls law in uh, liquid phase and the mixer also obeys dalton's law in vapor phase so these are the four uh, conditions they are not totally unrelated actually these conditions are related but uh, these are uh, based on these uh, four uh, points you can say whether a solution behaves as an ideal solution or not okay so uh, let us look at mathematically what do we mean by this So uh, condition one, condition one, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the solution of the specific volume of the solution should be simply equal to the sum uh, sum total of the specific volumes of the uh, components. Okay, so this is the mass fraction of component one, and this is specific volume of component one. This is the mass fraction of component two. This is the specific volume of comp uh, component two. Okay, so the specific volume of the mixer is simply equal to this. This means the um, solution neither expands nor contracts. That means there will not be any volume change upon mixing okay so this is for, for condition 1 and condition 2 the specific enthalpy okay since the no heat is released or absorbed it can be very easily shown that the specific enthalpy of the solution is simply equal to the weighted average uh, enthalpies of component 1 and component 2 okay xi1 and xi2 as i said are mass fractions h1 and h2 are the specific enthalpies of component 1 and 2 at that particular temperature and pressure okay so the same thing can be written in this form okay because xi1 xi2 is equal to 1 minus xi1 this is the condition the second condition and what is raoul's law raoul's law says that for an ideal solution the vapor pressure exerted by component 1 is simply equal to the product of its liquid phase mole fraction x1 x1 is equal to liquid phase mole fraction okay So it's a uh, vapor pressure exerted by component one is equal to the product of liquid phase mole fraction x one into p one sat. What is p one sat? P one sat is nothing but the saturated pressure of uh, sa the, this uh, component one at that particular temperature t. Okay, so p one sat is this. So the vapor pressure is given uh, for component one is given by this. For component two is given by this. Okay, where x two is the liquid phase mole fraction of component two. So this is what is known as Raoul's law. Okay. So if you know the composition, uh, composition, and if you also know the saturation properties, you can find out what is the vapor pressures in solution. Okay. What is Dalton's law? If you remember, Dalton's law is for the vapor phase, and it says that the vapor pressure in vapor phase is equal to the mole fraction of component one in vapor phase into the total pressure P total. Similarly, the vapor pressure for component two is equal to the product of mole fraction y2 into the total pressure okay this is the dalton's law okay so you can easily show that the vapor phase mole fraction y1 and y2 are related by this expression y1 plus y2 is equal to 1 just like your liquid phase mole fraction so y2 is by 1 minus y1 and the total pressure total pressure is nothing but the sum total of the pressures exerted by component 1 plus component 2 okay pv1 plus pv2 suppose if you have a component uh, which is non volatile let us